easy concepts. This life that I live is all yours. I'm moving her and my things all in you. I'm aligned to your will, not mine, but yours be done. Jesus, as in heaven, so on. Easy concepts. This life that I live is all yours. I'm moving her and my things all in you. I'm aligned to your will, not mine, but yours. Heaven, so on earth. This song. 
our lecturer for today. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Please, while we remain standing, we will start the program right away. May I invite the Dean of CST, Professor Timothy Anaki, to please come and lead in the opening prayer. Praise the Lord. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we worship you and exalt you this morning for who you are. We give you all the glory, we give you all the praise for this august occasion. We say, be thou glorified in Jesus' name. We thank you again because you are about to do something new in COVID-19 recovery. Benefit of the student, benefit of the faculty, and to the glory of your name. Therefore, Lord, we welcome your presence. Take absolute control. Thank you for the guest this morning, the lecturer who will be talking to us. We pray that you grant him utterance in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. At the end, Lord, we pray it will be impactful and we will all be blessed in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' precious name, we have prayed. Let's put our hands together. Thank you. Please, while we remain standing, we will take the national anthem and the Covenant University anthem, and this will be led by the studio. Studio, please. Thank you very much. You may please be seated. May I establish the protocols for the second NAS Ambassador Lecture. The Chancellor and the Chairman Board of Regents of Covenant University, Dr. David Oyedeku, the Pro-Chancellor, Bishop David Abuyi, esteemed members of the Board of Regents, they are present, the Vice-Chancellor, Professor Abiodun H. Adebayo, the Acting Registrar, Mr. Emmanuel Egan, other principal, uh, other principal officers of the university, deans of colleges and school of postgraduate studies, members of the university senate, the executive secretary, the National Academy of Science, Dr. Oladun Odubanjo, 
The second NAS Ambassador Lecturer, Professor Friday Okonoshua, FAS, faculty and staff, distinguished guests, virtual participants, kings and queens in Ebron, members of the press, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome you to this very special event. This is the second NAS Ambassador Lecture that is uh, put together by Covenant University in conjunction with the Nigerian Science Academy. Ladies and gentlemen, to situate the welcome, please put your hands together as I bring up the Dean of School of Postgra uh, Postgraduate Studies. Please put your hands together for Professor Akan Williams. Are you putting your hands together? Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I learned this time on the already established protocol. The Vice Chancellor, I'd like to welcome all of us to Covenant, especially the team from the Nigerian Academy of Science. Of course, especially our guest lecturer for today, who is going to be presenting the second NAS Ambassador Lecture. All over the world, universities are established for academy activities, basically. But there are don'ts and there are do's. So it is instructive that this morning we're going to be having a prepared meal by a guest lecturer. And uh, that has been cooked, well cooked. In the course of this, we're going to be hearing much about him, but I know he's a thoroughbred professional, a thoroughbred administrator, an academic par excellence. So we're going to be treated to a very inspiring lecture, I can assure you, this morning. We are trusting that at the end of the day, the things that are not expected in the academic tradition the ones that we should not be seen to be doing in the academic environment, in our activities, will be projected and signposted to all of us, and uh, we shall be the better for all of this. And so I'd like to welcome all of us to this very important lecture, and at the end of it all, all the glory shall be ascribed unto God. One more time, you are welcome. And let me note that our postgraduate students are also very much around here. And some of our colleagues are also watching online. You are welcome. Thank you very much, the Dean School of Postgraduate Studies, Professor Akan Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, to bring us a welcome address, would you please rise? and put your hands together as I bring up the Vice Chancellor of Covenant University in the person of Professor Abiodun H. Adebayo. Are you putting your hands together? Thank you so much. Please, let's be seated. The Chancellor and Chairman Board of Regent Covenant University, Dr. David O. Oyedeku. I want to specially recognize all our management team present here, Senate members of Covenant University, and our distinguished speaker for today, the lecturer presenting the second NAS Ambassador Lecture today, Professor Friday Okonofua. You are highly welcome. And I recognize the Executive Secretary of the Nigerian Academy of Science, also here present. And please permit me to equally stand on the already established protocol as I bring my remark. It is my pleasure to welcome every one of us here today as the chief host of the Nigerian Academy of Science, the second ambassador lecture with the team combating predatory academic activities. I'd like to acknowledge and welcome the lecturer, Professor Friday Okonofua, FAS. 
the Executive Secretary of the Nigerian Academy of Science, Dr. Oladun Odubanjo, and other guests to Covenant University where God is raising a new generation of leaders in our quest to restore the battered dignity and image of the African continent. And Covenant University is excited to host this second edition of the NAS Ambassador Lecture, often delivered by distinguished fellows of the academy. The theme of today's lecture is pertinent to a contemporary challenge in academia that is, if unaddressed, may erode the continued relevance of researchers and higher education system, institutions to the development of the society. Predatory activities, these predatory academic activities are undesirable global phenomena which gradually creeping into the scholastic culture and already becoming a norm. Predatory journals, publishers, and conferences have increased and are becoming more adept in their activities. The perpetrators of predatory academic activities seem to be exploiting the career pressure on the students and the academics, especially where you have the publish or perish syndrome. Their brain gimmicks are varied. It includes falsely listing reputable scientists as editorial board members, deceitful impactful factor, pay to publish without peer review, mimicking reputable journals and conference names, and unscrupulous invitation to fake conferences with high registration fee. It is worth reiterating that academic research which aims to seek the truth and explore new knowledge which enhances social economic development. Predatory academic activities do not advance this purpose and may lead to public distrust in science. And therefore, the scientific community must fashion a systematic response to the scourge of predatory academic practices. We are therefore delighted that the Nigerian Academy of Science is not only acquainting Nigerian researchers and the scientific community with the detrimental effects of this scourge, but also providing the needed, the needed knowledge and tools to combat it. Covenant University has a zero tolerance for predatory academic activities and practices as we have functional policies and regulations to drive this unpalatable and unacceptable act. Some faculty and staff members who were found to have compromised the integrity of academic processes had faced disciplinary committee of the university and depending on the degree of involvement, there are penalty that have been set out for erring faculty and staff, which ranges from sanctions to suspensions without pay and for future of promotion and up to five years or even termination and dismissal of the appointment in the university. Covenant will continue to encourage and support efforts aimed at preserving the sanctity of the scientific inquiries and publication and other best academic practices. We are pleased to partner with the Nigeria Academy of Science and other stakeholders as we work together towards eradicating this on wholesome practices and culture. Again, thank you for coming, and God richly bless you. Thank you very much. Please, let's receive the Vice Chancellor again with another round of applause. Thank you. You may please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, we have been told what we're here to do and the importance of this. One lecture for today, and that is a central part of what we are here to do. It tells you how important that lecture is, and how important the subject is to everyone that is present here today. But we tend to appreciate the content of a lecture more when we know the capacity and the personality that is bringing the lecture to us today. So to come and bring us the citation of our lecturer today, please would you put your hands together for the Director in the Vice Chancellor's Office, Professor Motai Osimbanjo. Thank you, sir. The Chairman, Board of Regents, Dr. David O. Oyedepo, 
kindly permit me to stand on the already established protocols. I have the singular honor and privilege to read the citation of the second Nigerian Academy of Science ambassador lecturer. May I respectfully request Professor Friday Okonofua to rise and remain standing while I take his citation. Thank you, sir. Professor Friday Okonofua, MD, PhD, FRCOG, FAS, FAAS, is a professor of obstetrics and gynecology and director of grants and research at the University of Benin, Nigeria. He is a fellow of the Nigerian Academy of Science and the African Academy of Science. He has served as the executive director of the International Federation of Gynecology and Obstetrics and also as an honorary advisor on health to the former president, Olusegun Obasanjo of Nigeria. <laughs> Professor Okonofua has published more than 340 journal articles and textbook chapters, three books, and obtained 46 international research grants. He is the founder, he is the founder of the Women's Health and Action Research Center, one of the Nigerians' leading NGOs, and the founding editor of the African Journal of Reproductive Health. He is a member of the editorial board of the British Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, editor of the BMC Pregnancy and Childbirth Journal, and a reviewer to several international journals. Professor Okonofua is the past editor-in-chief of the Proceedings of the Nigerian Academy of Science, published by the Nigerian Academy of Science. He has served as a program officer at the Ford Foundation and as consultant to several international agencies, including the MacArthur Foundation and the World Health Organization. <laughs> he is the team leader of the World Bank Center of Excellence in Reproductive Health Innovation and the coordinator of the World Bank Project at the University of Benin, Nigeria. In March 2020, Professor Okonofua completed his tenure as a pioneer vice chancellor of the first University of Medical Sciences in Ondo State, Nigeria. <laughs> and now he is the director of grants and research at the University of Benin, Nigeria. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, kindly join me rise with a round of applause as we received the second Nigerian Academy of Science Ambassador Lecturer, <laughs> Professor Friday Okonofua. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please be seated, please. <coughs> As uh, this is my first time officially visiting this university, this great university. <laughs> I want to very respectfully recognize the primary work that the Chancellor and Chairman of Board of Trust of Regents of this university, a great Nigerian icon that we all love, Dr. David Oyedipo. <laughs> we continue to appreciate the great work he's doing, not only for education, but in all firmaments of Nigerian development. I also want to very respectfully recognize my vice chancellor, my friend, Professor Abiodu Adebayo, <laughs> the acting registrar of the university, other principal officers of the university here present, my very distinguished executive secretary of Nigeria Academy of Science, respectfully inviting me to deliver the second lecture. Members of Senate, very senior professors here present, professors, heads of departments, colleagues, lecturers, students, ladies and gentlemen. I want to first of all very warmly 
appreciate the president of the Nigeria Academy of Science, Professor Ekanem Bright, for appointing me to deliver this second NANS ambassadorial lecture. I know, you know, <coughs> as will be described later on, that uh, this is not just a lecture that anybody undertakes. And the situation where you have very preeminent professors as fellows of the Academy of Science, you can then be sure that choosing me was a rare privilege, and I really, really appreciate it. I don't know whether I can see from behind or I need to turn. OK, so I, actually, I have the papers here as I'm turn. So today, um, first of all, let me just appreciate what I've seen. This today is my first day at uh, Covenant University. And I've heard so much about Covenant. And a few years ago, 2021 or 20, you were at if one of the best, I think the best university in Nigeria, and you ranked one of the best 500 universities in the world. An achievement which we have continued to salute, and for which I have had a lot of accolades. And today, I want to deeply appreciate the Vice Chancellor for leading that process. So, and when I came to the campus, I thought I was in England. I didn't know I was in Nigeria. So, but now, <laughs> seeing all of you here, <laughs> and that, uh, I'm really very happy to see that I'm here, and we got continue to grow this university in more ways than one. Today, I'm going to be talking about uh, over the combating, <coughs> I'm sorry, I want to apologize that over the last few days I've not been very well. Actually, I had to be hospitalized on Monday. So I'm not going to be in my best form. Those who know me will know that I'm not going to be in my best form, so I apologize for that. But I'll do my very best not to disappoint <coughs> the audience. So, <coughs> sorry. combating predatory academic activities. Over the next few minutes, it's about uh, 30 or so minutes, I will talk about this problem, this challenge that is facing academia worldwide, not just Nigeria, but worldwide. And the lecture is being organized in five parts, briefly. First, I will make some definitions to elucidate the scope and characteristics of predatory academic activities. Secondly, I will talk about the prevalence of predatory academic activities with special relevance and focus on Nigeria. How prevalent is it in Nigeria? And thirdly, I will explain the plausible reasons for predatory academic activities. And then fourthly, I'll make some recommendations, some of which the vast just showed that already carrying out at the regional at the Covenant University. But whatever I'm saying today have implication not just for Covenant University, but indeed for all universities in this country and beyond. So first I'm going to talk about this issue from two domains. When we talk about pedotic academic activities. One domain is the predictive academic conferences that dot the entire world these days. The second is the predatory academic journals that also feature mainly in our context. They are a spectrum of typology of journal and conference practices that range from those that are genuinely fraudulent to those that are unethical and questionable. And of course, the varying degrees of an acceptable to well-intentioned, low-quality practices. And I can tell you that every day I get invitation to these conferences. Even this morning, as I was opening my email, I mean, it's countless. And once they, they are able to uh, know where you are and the, the online uh, revolution that has taken place has made it possible for anybody to be contacted. And that is indeed when these uh, practices of predatory academic practice have come up. <coughs> First of all, let me talk about the conferences. These are conference meetings or academic meetings set up to appear as if they are legitimate scientific conferences, but which turn out to be 
exploitative. The word there is exploitative. And underline it. Sorry, I can't. See there, what's happening? Yes. These are conferences which may appear to be genuine, but which at the end they turn out to be exploitative. That word exploitative is a connotative word. The word is that any conference which is not genuinely academic, but which turns out to exploit you just because the person convening the conference wants to make some dollars or naira from it. Additionally, they do not provide adequate scientific content or editorial control over presentations. Recently, I was at the TED Fund in Abuja. And you know, TED Fund tends to fund uh, academics and students to attend conferences. And one of the points they said is that those conferences must be proven not to be predatory conferences. And they have a way of checking. And I will discuss that later on. They tend to be mixed vast conferences involving multiple disciplines. And I've been invited to conferences where I'm supposed to discuss engineering, even though I'm a gynecologist. I've been attended to come to conferences where agriculturists and uh, social scientists are participating. And often there's a lot of advertising which includes claim of high-ranking academics. Even Nobel laureates are told to come to such conferences. But when you get there, you don't see such Nobel laureates. So it's deceptive in the long run. <coughs> so here, I'm going to give you five characteristics by which you can name, you actually rank academic conferences. The first is selectivity. Any conference that is purely academic is selective, especially making sure that there's a focus and that the papers identified for that conference refer to the objective of the conference. And this will be two rigorous process of high quality review process. Then second is footprint. The idea of a conference is to bring people together of like minds, rather than people from different societies. So you want to bring doctors, good. You want to be pharmacists, you want to be pharmacologists, you want to be physicists. That is the footprint to make sure that there's a specialization that they are those are the enabled the people to interact and to network. Today, I'm interacting with my colleague professors. And when I leave here, I'm going to have names that I'm going to call get after because to make my progress in life. Nature of transaction. The pricing structure must be consistent with the purpose and the objective of the conference. Not over-costed, not under-costed. Sometimes they will under-cost it they will offer you telephone and tell you that they will give you a flight ticket. I remember very well when uh, I was starting and <laughs> somebody told me, one young girl who I just appointed told me that, oh, there's a conference, I don't be invited to the conference in New York, oh, there's a flight ticket and so, so forth. And by the time we started preparing for her to go, I was excited, the young girl working with me. Only to find out that everything was a promise based on zero and that the conference didn't really take place. And uh, credibility. If you want to attend a conference anywhere, please don't go to a conference where there have been no past record of such a conference. And even when there's a past record, find out, be sure that the person who has had such a conference is somebody with high level of credibility. And then the last is substance. The real objective of a conference, what you are going to get out of it must be known to you. What skills, what knowledge, what capacity, what you yourself are going to do in the conference must be well known. So, predatory conferences, they're highly advertised, beautifully, beautiful pictures. You can see here, they even put scopus to say that if you attend that conference, you'll be rated in scopus. And then they will ask you to get a list of upcoming conferences, to list them, bogus conferences, and then they will tell you that if you publish there, it will appear in high impact factor journals. They did tell you journals. So, and that promise ne will never come to reality. So, Predatory journals, and particularly for young academics, it's an attraction for them. Soft sell, because they offer you opportunities to travel abroad for the first time. You go to 
Oh, this conference is taking you to Berlin. Oh, yeah, young man has not been to Berlin before. He's attracted. And then secondly, they will offer you some things to meet some people. So young people particularly should be careful when you are seeking to go to a conference. It's a soft sell for young people particularly who are intending to start their career. But you must not begin your career by going to a fidelity conference. It's, you can misdirect you. Is that okay? <coughs> now, to finish this, the questions are number one. How do you identify fidelity conferences? Based on what I've said. Usually the conference covers a whole lot of topics. They will list 25 topics. Oh, it will talk about engineering. Oh, it will talk about water resources. Oh, environment. It will talk about health. It will talk about, be careful. No conference in two or three days can talk about everything on it. So that's the first suspicion. The second cause suspicion is that they often plan multiple conferences. So if you go to Europe, then why don't you attend conference A, conference B, and conference C at the same time or normally in the same venue? And then tell you, they will tell you that you will find out that once you submit an abstract today, even if it is a very bogus abstract with bad English, with bad, even if you write it in French, they will accept it almost immediately. In two days' time, you get an email saying that they accept it. So I can process your money and travel documents and pay the. And then the deadline for abstracts are often very close to the conference. They will be marketing it and then submitting it. And then we often talk how the presenters are often paying for, uh, for privilege to attend the conference. The second way to identify these conferences. The individual organization may not even be known. You'd be surprised. You may be, let's say, a uh, human resource practitioner. I saw a beautiful girl recently who, this morning in this university who gave me a very beautiful dissertation describing her. I hope she's here. You know, very beautiful. Uh, you saw her. She was very wonderful. If she was attending, and then you go there and you find that you go there, Organizations organizing that conference are not known. You don't know them. They will mention one name. Individuals are not known. You just see some strange names, Japanese, French, all meet together, Latin America, all of them. So that's one suspicion. And then you also say that this group have no evidence that they've done any conferences in the past. And the conference fees look unreasonable. Maybe too high or maybe too low. That's what it is. And then, really, a junket, a conference appears to be a junket, whereby you just go there and buy and sell and come back and look around and look at the River Thames River and all sorts of things and come back. And so we have been. And there are people who go to conferences and never really attend those conferences. They sit there, and as soon as they do the introduction of the speaker and they leave and go and be buying things in River Steen and uh, what do you call that street in London that you normally go to? Hotspur Street. And they come back carrying baggages, and that's a conference. That's a junket. And please, as academics, never you do that. So, and thirdly, how to you are, and, and you yourself, you know. Sorry. Okay, is it here? What of this one? It's showing. Okay. This for me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, the other way to know is. The process, when you are going to a good conference and you submit an abstract, your heart will be pounding. We dare accept this abstract. You'll be praying to God, please help me review this to make sure you follow the guideline. But in the case of fake conferences, the review process is not proper. You will not even know whether that was a review process. And all submissions made to that conference are almost accepted. Keynotes and committee members who are supposed to be in the committee are not really fully involved. And then they will say this conference is approved by the Vice Chancellor of Cumberland University. The Vice Chancellor is not aware of it. So false claims of institutional approval. Oh, it's approved by the Ondo, uh, what do you call it? Ogun State. Ondo is my second state. <laughs> the Ogun State government. Oh, by the Nigerian University Commission for credits, so you to get credits. So when you do this, you get more credit to become a medical practitioner. It's a lie, never approved. Those are things that first claims that never happen. So let me rest 
on that for conferences. I will now talk about Jonas, Tributary Jonas. These are Jonas published that use deceptive or questionable processes to profit from publishing scholarly works. Scholarly works are supposed to be things you do because you want to generate knowledge. But this time, some people are trying to market it to sell like they sell beans in the market. That's what it is. You know, they begin to sell it, they publish it so that they can get money from it. And then the more they publish, the better. Indeed, it is a growing concern in publishing, especially with the onset. It is because online, uh, we now, you know, I was telling my students a few days ago, the World Wide Web, WWE, whereby you can access things, began in 1993. And I remember I was in Harvard at that time when the thing started. And before then, we used to go to libraries and look for books and journals. But World Wide Web became even more effective after the millennium. So if there was no World Wide Web, there would be no problem with so-called uh, Predatory Journals. It's a process which even became accentuated when it now became normative for you to have what is called open access publishing. It is now normative that if you want to do well, you want to have high citation for your papers, then you have to do open access publishing. And that is what gave rise. One of the things, one of the issues, I will discuss the other issues later, what gave rise to Predatory uh, Academic Journals. And indeed, with the publish or perish syndrome, publish or publish university academic system, in our academic culture, it is also being potentiated by academics themselves. And I will explain that later. These are supposed to be a procedure by which people who are published want to make more money and want to profit from it rather than other things. But now, we have a, a demand side, whereby those of us, because if we don't publish, we don't, we don't become a professor. If we don't publish, you don't become a vice so to that extent, you become held on by these parties of predatory uh, academic journals. Why does this matter? Why does it matter? Why are we talking about it? Why is Nigerian Academy of Science? Professor uh, Odibanjo has been harassing me over the last two weeks. Oh, the vice chancellor has been calling me. Why are they concerned? Because also we took science up. Because when I was growing up and I was finishing my medical school, I said I was not going to do anything else other than going to the university and become a professor. Because I didn't know. I said that's the only way you can talk objectively and open your mind to people and write things objectively. But if you are to become a politician, you say 10 things and they are never correct. And in fact, the more incorrect things you have, the more they will vote for you and the ability to raise your hand. So I said I would go into science. Because science tells you, enables you to say the truth, and it can be verified. If I do something using the same standards in Nigeria, and use it, that standards are well described, it can be done in Ghana, it can be done in Kano, and so on and so forth. So, and the other way to do that is ethical application of primary principles. So if you begin to do this, then it means that uh, the principles of science will be highly jeopardized. And therefore, decisions that are supposed to be morally acceptable become unacceptable. And it becomes difficult to test the correctness of your decision making in science when ethical principles of that kind are no longer respected. To me, that is why if we are in the university system and we don't protect the integrity of science, then we have no reason to be here. We should be selling market, we should be selling rubber or selling uh, Gary in the market. I'm going to apply to become. Uh, uh, principal officers in either PDP or APC or Labour Party, that's to make it So, ladies and gentlemen, quality and integrity in science are. Nigeria Academy of Science is a protector of quality and integrity of science in this country. And that's why we're taking it to higher levels. When we think of quality and excellence in science, we think of the truthfulness of the results. We, our findings, stand the test of peer review. We at least stand the test of repeatability using the same methods. If I do it in Covenant University, 
if it is repeated the redeemer where my friend professor happy is will it stand the test of time and the results of our research is the end product of a process of decision making from the initial choice of topics the framing of research questions research design methodological choices and eventually i was very impressed with the student i took spoke to this morning and a young undergraduate and i asked her what is this are you right she said, this is and she defended it i was so impressed that i told the vc that if i was here and i was the standard examiner she gets a first class honestly <laughs> that is science she was able to describe her methods she was able to talk about how she did it the results for an assailable she described analysis of data using spss bivariate analysis motivated analysis i asked her about the, what type of conceptual framework she used i was so impressed and uh vice chancellor i'm going to send some i'm going to give that girl hundred thousand wow. dollars i don't know whether I, so sir i'll send it to you i'll send it to you and you can give it to her right. thank you sir so this thing guys ladies and gentlemen I repeat, predatory journals are journals that circumvent the rigor of academic publishing. Rigor. I, put, I sent a paper to a journal and, uh, last year, and it was only in January this year they accepted after rigorous reviews. And after that, they asked me to pay $5,000 for publication. And I had to struggle to pay that $5,000. So, but if I was offered hundred dollars, I could jolly well. And I had a number of journals asking me to send. Oh, before then, at the time I was submitted, up to fifteen or even more, asking me that I would pay only fifty thousand, fifty fifteen hundred. Five, sorry, fifteen dollars or so for publication. Such outlets deviate from the international best practices. I'm not sure all of us here know what to do when we have trying to publish our papers. Now, a, the watchdog, there's somebody called Jeffrey. And I know everybody, anytime you go, go and ask for the dirty journal, the name of this young man, Jeffrey Bear, will pop up because he's the one who have been identifying a lot of these uh, dirty journals. They generate profits by charging auto fees, also known as article processing charges. They typically solicit manuscripts by spiny researchers. And the journals, and I think because I have a Yahoo account, that's the reason why most of the time I get these emails. And they exist and they practice very suspicious editorial practices. And to date, Jeffrey I don't know where I am now. Okay, is it going back? Is it sorry. This is the correct one? I should go now, yeah. Okay. So the Jeffrey listed two main lists. Almost about 1,220 predatory journals, journal titles. He also cites a publishing house. He actually listed out. It's almost like an ombudsman, you know, that is notorious for publishing questionable uh, journal articles. In January, sorry, I don't know who this is. Am I okay? In January 2021, last time we checked, he listed about 900 active publishers. And uh, the total number was uh, almost a staggering 23,000 and more titles. 
so that if you really want, I've left the website. I'm sure that you have slide this slide, this uh, particular uh, presentation slides. You will find out that you see the lists of these journals in this website. Now, which are the countries that contribute the most to pediatric journalism? I think that's the list. The highest, the country with number one is India. Second is Iran. And our dear country, Nigeria, is number three. As a matter of fact, I will explain that further. U.S. is number four. Malaysia, Malaysia, Malaysia is number five. I will come to that later on. So, don't be deceived that Nigeria is only number three there. But indeed, Nigeria is the highest in the world. And you see this ratio. When you say extent of pediatric publishing is a Nigerian challenge, the ratio of journals published in pediatric journals versus those published in Thompson Reuters, Web of Science, the one where you publish higher ranking articles. So what it's saying from this table is that once, if you have 100 articles published in Thompson Reuters, Web of Science in Nigeria, 1,580 will be published in pediatric journals out of every 100. If you have 100 articles published in Ruta, Thomas, or Thompson's uh, Ruta's uh, website, about 1,500. In India, even though they have the highest fruit, if you have 100 published in uh, Thompson's Ruta's, only 277 will be published in uh, predatory journals. In Iran, if you have 100 pres present in in uh, Reuters uh, Web of Science, 70 will be published in British journals. In the US, if you have 100 published in Reuters journal, only seven will be published in British journals. So the, journal, the problem is Nigerian problem. And you recognize that Nigeria has the highest ranking in terms of use of pediatric journal, uh, pediatric, pediatric, pediatric publishing. In the, in the world? That is the question. So we'll talk about why it is so later on, briefly. Now, what are the disciplines that are most affected? Science, 35%, 35%. Medicine, 21.8. And technology, it's 20%. So if you look at it, 10 disciplines, because 10, science, technology, uh, engineering, mathematics, that is what we talk about, how a country can develop. It comes from STEM. Yet, about uh, more than 70% of pediatric journalism, uh, pediatric publishing comes from science. And so if you see a professor of science, professor and he says, I'm a scientist, you have to check further his ranking in terms of impact factor. Because if you are if you published in a pediatric journal, your impact factor cannot be too high because many of these are not published in traffic. So it's so surprising that it is all disciplines where we need more advancement that we have this higher level of pediatric publishing. So, more, the Ottawa de Declaration. Pediatric journals and publishers are entities that prioritize self-interest at the expense of scholarship and are characterized by false or misleading information, deviation from best editorial and publication practices, a lack of transparency, and or the use of aggressive and indiscriminate solicitation practices. And I'm sure many of you are must be getting invitation to publish and so on and so forth. And I know if you're in academics and you're in Yahoo or Gmail, you will get such messages. So why? What are the characteristics of pediatric journals? First, they seek profit over, this is just a summary, because I've said it before, over contribution to scholarship. Then secondly, they must represent abstracting, indexing, and metrics. Aggressive advertising and solicitation for, for manuscripts. 
inappropriate journal titles. Sometimes they like to journal title global. If you hear global journal of this, international journal of this, and all that, green journal of this, then they, there's one they call uh, eastern journal of this, or the Shoni journal of this. Then be careful. Inappropriate journal titles. Lack of transparency in governance, editorial policies, publication practices. Furthermore, they deliberately deceive the authors by not disclosing the APC, which APC is not is the <laughs> is not is not the one <laughs> is the article publishing prices, and then they hide information about revenue that they get, and then most of the time they will tell you they simultaneously launch a large number of journals. I've seen somebody who came to me and said, oh, I want to manage your journal. And I said, we already published about 120 journals. I said, my friend, leave my office, and so on and so forth. That is how to know them. How can you publish 120 journals, and so on and so forth. Now, misrepresentation of abstract. They are characterized by false claims of indexing in Web of Science, Scopus, and there's a way you can find out whether a journal is indexed in Scopus. Claims of inclusion of databases of companies, and then claims are misleading of fake metrics. It's part of what they say. And then call for papers, you know, aggressive, ag aggressive uh, advertising. You know, they are characterized by daily indiscriminate emails. And you see that many of you get many to prospective authors, especially if you are published somewhere else and they see you are published, they begin to pursue you. There's a paper I published somewhere today, this morning, published about uh, 2020. They are telling me now that they want to turn it into a book. They wrote a long, uh, and sometimes they will be greeting you as if they know you. Oh, dear Friday, you are so, so you, are good. you are the best, uh, this, they solicit using us for mentors. They thank you, oh, good, good Monday. How are you today, how is Nigeria? And then, they use flat tree language, that's what I mean. Familiar, but I did they have met you before. And then, of course, the use of business marketing language. You know, they will tell you that if you submit two articles, you will pay for only one. Again, that is business language. If you buy 10 cars, you get one free. That's what they call those people. That's what they advertise. So, we should be wary of sojourners. What is this? Inappropriate journal, title, and scope. They are characterized by a broader disciplinary, they will say, global journal of health sciences, or global international journal of basic medical sciences. That is, basic medical sciences are so many. How can you international journal covers all those things? Or basic research journal applied and pure and applied sciences, meaning that anything you bring, even if you bring one from fishery, you get one there. If you want to bring for you get one. That is how they operate. And then copying the titles of acclaimed journals, for example, Science and Nature, you know. And then, let me say, in 2018, I was using such terms. They use such terms as modern journal, innovative, green, progressive, ingenious, standard, are frequently used as titles of predatory journals. So, ladies and gentlemen, I don't want to bore you because I want questions. Now, summarize. This is just the last summary before I go on to my recommendations. What are the differences? And I want people who are just starting, because if you start poorly as academic, it will not be too good. The differences between mainstream journal and the predatory journals. The first is peer review. It tends to be strict. So don't worry, it is strict. I remember when I wrote my first paper and they wrote to me, and they told me everything that was wrong under the world, and they said reject. I went back, I cried, I'm really sure I cried. Oh, is this how it's going to be? And now, continue. I went back and cleaned my face and continued. Straight. But that's what science is all about. And, you know, if you start writing, look at the principles of scientific writing. What does science mean? What are you writing for? Are you writing? You are writing because you want to expand the scope of knowledge. So your writing must show new knowledge. You can't be writing a scientific article and it is what somebody has done in the past. It has to be new knowledge. And you do it in such a way to 
defined clearly the objective, and then the methods with which you elucidated the objectives and report and then comment. That's all. And you know, if I get the results of a paper on a Friday, now these days, afternoon, my students finish and my boys finish. They say these are the results and look at the results and agree, oh, it's good. By Monday morning, they get the paper. They do it. It's very easy. Introduction, methodology, results, discussion, references. I will throw it back to them. I say, go and organize the references. Or they will do a draft for me following those principles. And once they have done that, that's no difficulty. So, and then you, you, because the more you get your paper reviewed by street peer review process, the more you become confident, the more you write, write better papers. I can show you. Now, I can tell you when I started, the rate of rejection of my paper was like 90%. And every year I continue to see that it's falling down. In fact, in 2022, the rate of rejection of my paper is uh, 2%. I'm telling you. I will send out a paper that is stupid, that has sorrows. I would have done all my work, and I will make sure. And I don't publish. I have never published in an epidemic journal. If I send you my CV, you will see. I will never. And that's, so the cost of publishing in mainstream tend to be high. Whereas for predatory journal tend to be low because they want to attract more papers. It is high because of open access and so on and so forth. And I told you just now, I paid $5,000. You can check. Hmm? Papers, journals like Lancet, like British Journal, Open, or PMJ Open, and so on and so forth. And if you, are, if you are being asked to pay anything less than 1,000 these days, the way I publish, know that that journal is only because it's helping, maybe helping, or if it's less than $500, or less than $400, you know that you have to suspect that sort of journal. And in any case, they will tell you, we can do discount. Once they realize that uh, they are going to lose your money, they tell you 400, okay, I'll give you 50% discount. If you still argue, they say that I'm a student, oh, they say, okay, we'll make you $100. They be, they just as you go to the market and say, Guguru, they start pricing. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the location of mainstream journals, the main of them tend to be, in mainstream journals, they tend to be in developed countries, UK, US, and so on and so forth. Whereas, predatory journals, they tend to be in underdeveloped countries, Iran, Africa, Nigeria, Ethiopia, so on and so forth. You know, and the indexing. They are indexing in the mainstream journal and recognized and done with high level qualifications. Whereas the criteria for indexing in predatory journal tend to be less severe. Impact factor tend to be high in high in uh, mainstream journal. As a matter of fact, before I publish this, is, I must look at the impact factor of any journal. And if you want citation for you to get uh, an impact factor yourself, then you have to publish in high impact factor journal. It tends to be high in esteemed journal. Whereas it is low or absent, they may not even tell you about it or they may lie about it in predatory journals. The editorial team in mainstream tend to be recognized. If you open a journal, British Journal of Sangaini, I know all the editorial members, British Journal or whatever in my feed, BMJ open, I know all the editorial journals, I know that. If I open a journal and they say open journal of obstetrics and gynecology and I look at the editorial list, I don't know that at this my age, then of course, then you have to suspect all journal. In predatory journals, I never know. Because nobody will invite me to come and be a predatory editor of a journal or a member of editor of a journal. I just ignore such as. And the financial targets uh, for mainstream, they tend to be lucrative because as a member of the editorial board of Bridge General Sagani, we also talk about profits. We see that, ah, this time we made this, ah, we need to cover the salary, we need to do this. But, you know, also to account for open assets because in the good old days, you used to sell journals and they pay for article prices. But these days, it's not going to be easy for you to carry copies of journals. And if you want to subtract a journal, you have to pay for it. So for high mainstream journal, the cost is still high. But for lucrative for predatory journal, they are, the only thing they're looking for is the, the profit and nothing else, not for scholarship. And many of them, if you look at, if I read some papers coming out for predatory journal, and in your field, you laugh because you will not recognize the paper. <coughs> Let me give you an example of 
invitation from a credited journal book publisher. Thanks for your email and interest. We are contacting you from BP International. We can help you to publish. That's the way they write. You can also publish more than 500 books. To date, check the book site. We have our headquarters in Bengal, in India. We have a register office in London, so on so forth. That's the way they advertise. If you carry the way, because you heard of Bengal, some of you have been asked to come. <laughs> so that's the way. Let me give you another example of publishing. You said, and, uh, well, is that where I am? Yes, that is the one I said before. This is, uh, this is one not very clear. It's remedy, we call it remedy publications. It's, uh, uh, he said, this is, I may not be able to, let me read it to you. As an editorial board member of the Annals of Diabetes Research, we kindly request you to submit two-page editorial or two short communications, which would be considered for publication in the inaugural issue. Tentative timeline for the submission of manuscript should be on 14th, 15th May, 2017. So are, this is the first issue. I'm sure so many of you must have received such a and so send me one article to complete it. Please, quick, 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 quick. Article is free, so that's true. And some people actually do it because they want the number game. They say, oh, they want to get promotion. Oh, the promotion is in September. Oh, my God. Oh, I have only 15. We are supposed to get 16 publications. Therefore, please, let's go and publish because you get it. It's an international journal. If you publish a paper at the University of Benin or University of, we say, oh, unless you publish an international journal, you don't get promotion. People will go and look for international journal in Iran. They go to Ethiopia. They go to Ghana. They go to international journals. So, to complete my lecture, ladies and gentlemen, Sabah Sensor Sir, thank you very much for distributing passion. To complete my lecture, I need to just uh, tell, see, ask some questions about why predated publishing. And I characterize them into two factors the supply factors. Because the, supp the supplier are the publishers who are supplying you. If there are no publishers, there will be nobody to publish them. First is the digital movement. I talked about it earlier on. This began when the WW, when I was an undergraduate and I was asked to write a thesis. I went to the library, about from the World University Library. I sat down for days looking at industry. A librarian was taking me around. Nobody does that these days. With your laptop, you can be good to get and some information. That's one. Secondly, the pressure on open access publishing by the journals have been asked to publish openly. Then thirdly, the need to make money, profit, commerce, commerce, which is growing in both developed and developing countries, but more in developing countries. They want to earn dollars because sometimes the money is charging dollars and they want to earn dollars and so on and so forth. And then more universities, universities focusing on quantity and volume of publications rather than the quality of publications. That is it. Oh, you must get 15 papers, become associate professors. You must get something like that. Nobody asks about the content of these papers. Those are the supply factors I make people to go for, you know, predated journalism. Uh, sorry, if I say journalism, pardon me, because like I told you, I'm not well. I'm just stammering. <laughs> <laughs> so, those factors, we should look at ourselves. I'm going to talk about that. How can we say, the pastor, the man that discovered insulin, let me even say that, the one that discovered um, IVF, who made IVF possible, they test two baby, Professor, uh, uh, what's his name now, Step 2, Edwards and Step 2. Edward is the obstetrician, Step 2 is the physiologist. They work together to discover how to make babies outside the tube. And they wrote three papers, and they got Nobel Prizes. That singular paper and themselves, discovering IVF, which has transformed lives of people, led to them. In fact, Professor, when I got my PhD at Karunika Institute, which is the university that offered Nobel Prize, that was the same year they gave honorary degree to Professor Edwards, and I had my hand to shake with him. Only I, I was very lucky to shake his hand before he died. He died two years ago. May so rest in perfect peace. He wrote a few papers. He didn't write too many. That paper led to transformation of the world. That today people are happy that they can solve the problem of infertility. That couples, it wasn't the number of papers that made Edwards discover that. 
So universities must be careful to focus on quality rather than quantity. The second factor are the demand factors. We are also demanding it. The people who are now lecturers and professors are also asking, I must publish, I must get one paper. I remember one day I was, I was sitting in my office, somebody from, I don't want to mention the part of the country, wrote me, ah, hey, Prof, uh, I want to send a paper to you, uh, pro 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 promotion, it's next week, uh, I want a paper, please send me a letter of acceptance, I will pay a letter, I said myself, I said, do you, what did you call me? He said, Professor Konofa. <laughs> I said, okay. I hope you know who Kokonofa is. He said, yes. I said, you are asking me to send you a letter of acceptance because you are having promotion next week. <laughs> My friend, don't call me again. Don't ever try that. I said, because <laughs> I'm not a published and perish professor. <laughs> <laughs> so, pressure to publish or perish. And I told one person who was fighting to be a professor. I said, it is, not, it is dangerous to be a wrong professor. It is better to be not to be a professor than a professor who is not known for anything, who cannot defend his professorship. And there are many like that. It's dangerous. That is the day you kill your career. To say you have been named a professor of so so so, of global engineering, professor of architecture, professor of this and that. And meanwhile, you are professor nothing. When they ask you to come and talk in Ottawa, they will come and ask England a bit more. Thing. And they will know. They will know that. So that's the first thing. So the, that and the promotion could not drum. Promotion could not drum. Promotion post on paper. Unwillingness of our people to do high quality research that is publishable. Because high quality research will demand time, will demand work. They just want to do something and review papers and so on and so forth. And next day, they prefer I can get promotion. Ignorance. Some people don't even know that there's something called predatory journals. Am I correct? And some people publish the art of ignorance because they write to you. Like, I published with a young author, co author of the paper. And then the person will write to me to say, ah, Since I published that paper, a number of people have been calling me to come and send paper to come and do this. I said, Okay, send me one of those letters to me. Just, if, just uh, copy me or send it to me. Send it to me. Happen to be one of those predated journals. I said, Are you going to actually send paper to this journal? He said, Oh, what is predated journal? I said, Go and check it and come back to me. This was just a few weeks ago. And then there's also pressure to publish. So university will tell you, unless you publish social number of papers and journals, you can't get promoted. Some will say, if you don't publish, in even national, some people will say national, they will say regional and local. You won't publish, and so on and so forth. Pressure to publish in the journals. All journals should be rated according to their individual merit. We know how to rate journals now. Impact factor, you know? In 2022, I know the impact factor of my journal. And when I saw it, I started jumping up. Time is up. Okay, good. I should finish. So, how do you avoid predatory publishing? One, the email tone is overly informal. The journal website is often not shown. The publisher is often not specified. Publish the, the journal reputation is often unknown. And there are, I've left some websites you can check to see some of these predatory journals that are well known. And then I'll show you additional websites to identify them. And then, and more to identify them. And then, Yale University. Now, finally, I'm going to come to the last one or two slides. How do we prevent predatory journal institutions? And I know that the, I think the vice chancellor has told me that there is a policy on research and publication, which includes authorship. Should you push away a junior lecturer or a junior student job because uh, you are the supervisor, you put yourself as first author? That's to me unethical. If it's a medical student, sorry, it's an undergraduate student that led and did the work, it should be the first author. But don't push away the junior author. And even the author of these days, they say, oh, single authorship. To me, if I see a paper single authored, then I'll be very worried. The multidisciplinary is, more, is better. Is that okay? People respect when there's multiple authorship of the alpha background. And then we should review promotion criteria to include quality publication rather than the numbers. And there are ways of doing that. You sit down and say, 
unless you have this. And a small fat, uh, before a journals, a paper is submitted for high ranking publication, you can also uh, subject it to PDT journal check and just ask a committee to look at it. And then use of academic impact factor. For example, if you Google my name now, you can go to anywhere, Google uh, Scholar or whatever it is, you will see my impact factor, Friday Okonofa. The number of people, you will see it scrolling down, scrolling down to computer classes. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> and so anybody can be filled into that Google network. And therefore, the Nigeria Academy of Science is already recommending, unless you have an impact factor of 20, don't even start. Because you'll be disqualified from becoming a member fellow of the college, at least 20. It's after that you go through a process. I think my, my dear secretary, secretary will initiate those process. And then sanctions to any academic who publishes in high level international journals, in high level journal, I'm sorry, predatory journals. So, ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, the solution to the challenges discussed in this presentation should be the joint responsibility of government, the educational sector, NUC universities, and you scholars yourselves. You have the responsibility to ensure that your own research and publications practices comply with the highest standards of quality and integrity. Predatic journals or practices attack the very nature and fabric of science. If allowed to continue, public trust in science will decline. The consequence for public funding of science in this country and elsewhere, because if they don't trust you, they won't give you money to do research. Third one will stop funding you. That will be a disaster. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, and the high rate of predatory publishing in Nigeria is unacceptable. We have the responsibility to stop it. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Please would you put your hands together again for our speaker of today. Thank you very much. You may please be seated, sir. Thank you so much. How many of us learned a lot of things from that presentation today? Can you raise your hand up? How many of us know now how to detect a conference that is predatory? Can I see your hands up? Good. How many of us now know how to tell a journal that is good from one that is predatory? Can I see your hands up? Please put your hands together again for our speaker today. Thank you very much, sir. Everybody listen with rapt attention. Of course, you also know that it's okay to cry when you get rejection, right? Aha. Uh -huh. So that's... <laughs> but like our prof said, the rejection is to make you go back and do your work. And as you don't, you know, you don't spare any effort. You put in every single thing. And as you improve with every comment, your rate of rejection starts to drop and then you find out that you are doing a better job. Please would you put your hands together again for our professor? Thank you very much, sir. So right away, we'd like to learn about how to become a, uh, a fellow of the academy, the process and the procedure. And to bring us that is the executive secretary of the Nigerian Academy of Science. Please would you put your hands together for Dr. M. Oladoing Odubanjo. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Um, Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the Chairman, uh, Board of Regents, and Chancellor, uh, Dr. David Oedeko, and I stand, and the Vice Chancellor also present, I stand on the established protocols. I know that we're now uh, racing against time, uh, but I will, so I'll make this rather brief. Um, I had some slides, I don't know if you want me to use them, but I can say uh, what needs to be said. I'll start by saying that the Nigerian Academy of Science is the foremost independent okay, is the foremost independent scientific body in the country. And I underscore uh, those two words, of course, foremost we know. Independent means that it's not a government institution. So uh, when pe people see Nigerian in the name of something, they think it's government. It is not. Uh, it was started uh, in 1977, making it the uh, third oldest, actually, sometimes that's debatable, uh, third oldest such institution or academy in Africa, the first being Madagascar, second is Ghana, 
uh, and then Nigeria. But the counterparts in the developed world are actually much older. So in the, the competition for the oldest is between Germany and the UK, which is way over 350 years uh, old, and the US is over 150 years old. Uh, I call the academies the secret weapons of development uh, because they are sources of independent, unbiased advice uh, of a scientific nature to governments around the world. So the developed countries, as the name suggests, have used these institutions uh, to their benefit, and that is why in Africa such uh, a development started, and currently I think we have about 28 academies uh, across uh, Africa who are also members of a um, ne network of African science academies. The academies, as it were, you know, have the, uh, they have what I'll term two functions. Number one function is largely the promotion of the development of science, uh, which is that anything that advances the course of science, such as even this lecture, uh, are the things that the academies do. But primarily, they are known for election or honor, honoring distinguished scientists. Uh, and for the Nigerian Academy of Science, that is honoring distinguished Nigerian scientists. Those who are not Nigerian scientists can be honored by election into the fellowship as foreign fellows. Uh, so we, we've heard from one of the distinguished Nigerian scientists, uh, Professor Friday Okonofua, this morning. Uh, but since 1977 to date, because they very a strict merit-based process. Uh, from 1977 to date, we have just about 278 scientists who have ever been successfully elected because of how rigorous it is. Uh, I tend to tell people that it's akin to what the lawyers have as SAN, when they say somebody is a son in Nigeria, which I'm sure most of us are familiar with. Uh, so uh, it, the name of a scientist like Professor Friday Okonofua should indeed not be written without FAS behind it uh, because it, it shows how distinguished he is. Um, and the second function is that it provides science, what we call science advice, which is how do you bridge the gap between the scientific world or the research world and the real world. So policy making world, policy implementation, so you do a lot of research here at Covenant University. Uh, what are the implications for development? And how do the policy and decision makers get to use this uh, that is what the academies globally do. They tend to interpret uh, science. So again, some refer to them as the Supreme Court of Science. So they tend to interpret the science. So if you look at our products, the uh, interpretation of science, they are in language that can be easily understood. However, they are scientifically accurate and they have gone through processes to ensure and protect that accuracy. Uh, so because of uh, how prestigious it is, uh, okay, so the slides are up. I've gone through that, although there's, you know, uh, and it's also, the academy is also the voice of science uh, in Nigeria and for Nigeria. So it is a national member of what is known as the International Science Council, uh, which is the global body for all science associations and unions, uh, and it's a, a UN affiliate. Nig the Nigerian Academy of Science is the national member representing Nigeria on that body. It's also the uh, member for the Inter-Academy Partnership, which is the global umbrella body for all academies globally, uh, as well as such bodies as the Network of African Science Academies, which is the body for the academies in Africa. Um, okay, I've said it's non-governmental and it's uniquely positioned, so. Okay, great. So, provides, I've already spoken about some of these things, what it does, and I've broken it down actually into two things, which is one, it promotes the development of science, so we have the honorific role, we have things like the award of prizes, we have a gold medal of science, and I think I forwarded that to uh, the vice chancellor recently because the call is currently on, and this year is for physical sciences, for distinguished work done. Uh, people can get an award by the uh, Nigerian Academy of Science. And then I've talked about the second function, which is the science advice role. Uh, basically, so the activities are many. We have such activities related to the induction of fellows, public lectures. This will be one of such things. Uh, media roundtables, we have prizes and awards. We have workshops, summit, scientific conference. Uh, we've started now a scientific conference, again, to address the predatory uh, conferences and all of that. 
Uh, we've started a scientific conference host every year in January. We've had the third one this year now. Uh, and that is the kind of conference you can apply to, you know, in Nigeria and say, look, I know this is not predatory. If I can get my abstract presented there, it means it is good. It goes through a, pre, I mean, a rigorous process of screening. So look out for that as well. It will happen January 2023. The fourth edition will, will take place then. Um, so we have webinars. There are several. Uh, COVID-19 is just an example. We had several. We had a COVID-19 series of webinars uh, on different areas of that. Uh, many of the fellows serve on different government uh, advisory panels, even being invited by government to nominate people. Uh, things like supervision of research. There was also, uh, for instance, a special arrangement with TED for under COVID-19 for NAS to supervise some six special grants uh, given out on COVID-19 to look into local diagnosis and therapy of, of COVID-19. And of course, we have a lot of collaboration uh, with private sector and what have you. So. The real thing is um, how to become a fellow. I've given you a little of this, uh, how difficult and distinguished it is. See, if, if since 1977, over 40 years, only 278 people there about have been successfully elected. That is not unique to Nigeria. By nature, like I said, uh, academies are limited in membership, whether by what you call um, rate of increase or by total number. So. The Nigerian Academy of Science has actually gone through the spectrum. So initially, you could not have more than 100 fellows at any given time. Uh, and that means, so if to be elected, it means that uh, somebody has to be gone. So I usually joke and I say they found that that was very dangerous to life. Uh, and therefore, it needed to be changed, you know, so... Uh, it became a case of a rate of increase. So the rate of increase became the measure. And um, that went from being three a year. Can you imagine that? Just th three scientists being elected a year to now it's 10 a year. Okay, so that's still very difficult. But <laughs> So when you get elected, that is quite a feat. <laughs> okay, and then they had FAS behind their name. So when you see FAS, you know what that means, Fellow Academy of Science. Um, so I've talked about this rate of acc accretion. Um, okay. And then, so to begin a process, it's not an application, it's a nomination. Uh, and that is part of the screening process. It's expected that somebody who is already a fellow of the academy uh, nominates a scientist that he knows. So it means that he already has an idea. He's not just looking at the person on Google uh, or whatever. He knows that person. He knows the kind of work he's been doing. Uh, and even character, if you wish. you know. So he has an idea of who this is, then he nominates the person. And he gets three other fellows to sign that nomination form, basically saying we also endorse uh, this nomination. And once that, that is done, uh, that has to be screened. Okay, That is going to first go through an initial screening. There are some criteria Professor Konufa mentioned, for instance, uh, things like the, um, what do you call it, Google citation, uh, and, and all of that, that is going to be used, okay? And they will just check some of those things. If the person doesn't meet uh, the minimum criteria, they are immediately just screened out. Uh, but if that nomination goes through that one, then it is now s sent to specialized sectional committees, as we call them, uh, which are on specific fields, so medical sciences, uh, environmental sciences. So they send the documents to, to the appropriate committee, and that committee is going to now screen all the candidates that they get and score them. And the top three candidates are recommended to the council of the academy uh, for consideration for shortlisting. Okay, so there are 11 such sectional committees. Each one uh, is going to recommend their top three candidates they get that year. Uh, to the council and say consider for shortlisting, but the council can also only shortlist 20 people for the ballot paper. And so at the end of the day, the council shortlists 20 people, and the 20 people and uh, their documents are sent to all fellows of the academy for voting. And when they vote, the, you, to be considered electable, you must get at least 50% of the total votes cast. And then of that 50%, it also means that you must be in the top 10 for you to be considered elected. So that process is pretty strict. 
uh, is totally merit-based. Um, over the years, I can tell you, I've seen ministers rejected. I've seen, so it's a merit-based process. Uh, it's not, I've also heard people who say, oh, you know, this per person is there, doesn't like me. I say, well, it won't matter. It, it, if your papers are there, you get through, you get through. That person cannot stop you. Uh, it's based on your work. Okay, so it's a very uh, strict process uh, and it's strictly merit based. So let me say that the academy, in conclusion, the academy is committed to establishing and maintaining the highest standards of scientific endeavors and achievements in Nigeria and is interested in developing working relationship with all stakeholders nationally, internationally. We have several collaborations globally uh, and thereby delivering the divin dividends of science to the society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. So I believe that we are all aware now of how to join, nominated, actually. So uh, by the per permission of the Vice Chancellor, I would entertain only two questions because of time. And... Um, if we have two questions, please can, would you raise your hand and uh, we'll take it quickly and then the questions will be responded to. Uh, okay, I have one and I have two, I think. To two more. Please let's put our hands together to our, uh, for our Vice Chancellor. Thank you very much for being very gracious, sir. Uh, thank you very much. So we have, uh, the Vice Chancellor has permitted us to extend to two. Please give one to... Maxwell, thank you very much. So we'll please want to take all the questions together and then uh, our professor will respond to it all. Yes, please. Okay, please introduce yourself. Tell us your name, your department, and then your question. Okay, thank you very much. My name is Dr. Omeja Maxwell from Physics Department. So thank you for your insightful uh, presentation. I just have very um, simple questions, sir. But before then, let me take it from somewhere. 2012 to 13, I was made to know the difference between predatory and um, good journals. So then if I publish, the, oh, sorry, if my paper is accepted, they will just say thank you for your contribution. And that will give me joy. At times I will submit. Before I finish drinking water, you see rejection. <laughs> Severally. From there, I started improving until I improved to some extent. Currently, something happened that um, I said, thank God that you are here today to show us some things to us. I sent a paper to Journal of uh, Hazardous Material, 10.58. So after uh, nine weeks, nine reviewers' comments came. All of them were saying almost the same thing. Then all of a sudden, one of, the editor, one of the editors, one of, one of the editorial members sent me a private email referring me to a journal I will send it, that when I send it there, it will not pass through any review. That it will just be accepted. And when I check through the journal, it's in the Savior 2, it's in Power Factor 3 point something. Then how do we manage this kind of situation? But that journal they referred me to, uh, for me to get the paper published, I would pay like 1,800 uh, dollars. So how do I handle this kind of situation? Since but that, do I replied to him or her that how, how did you, you rejected from, uh, you rejected the paper and now referred me to another journal that I will pay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, please, Mr. Manu, can you, I saw a hand there. Okay, that's number, okay. We'll take two. That's number two and then we move to this side. Dr. Maxwell, that is journal negotiation. Thank you, sir. Um, my name is Honi Olon um, master's student in the So my question is um, about journal publications and APC. I actually do wonder why scientists have to spend a lot of money on carrying out researches, and then we still have to pay for um, processing charges and eventually it becomes an open access journal. Even those that don't become open access journals, it is the journal that eventually places prices on um, those publications. Why do we have to spend so much on research 
and still have to do uh, processing charges. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very good question. Please, can we come to the side? Please raise your hand. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sonia Nkomo. I'm MSc Chemical Engineering. So I want to ask, um, are there, are there um, journals that accept papers? Okay, take for example, you're doing uh, an analysis to do um, an extraction process. And for example, you've read several journals and they said there are certain components that are present in whatever, whatever you're trying to do an extraction with. And then, for example, if you do um, a GCFID, um, gas chromatography, f uh, flame ionization detection, and you don't get to find those components that have been reported in several journals, how do you, how do you report it? What type of journals accept, um, should I say, negative results? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Do I have one more? Okay, I think we have all the questions we are going to take. Please let's uh, put our hands together as I invite our lecturer for today to please respond to those questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for those very excellent uh, questions. I actually referring you to another journal sometimes happens. And it has happened to me before, that. Uh, there are some series of journals, BMC, for example, about 10 of them. Then it's a family of journals published on that BMC. And so if you inadvertently send to one of those journals and it's not their area of coverage, they can refer you to, to a similar journal in that same group of journals. But the process of review will still be rigorous. And they will tell you that, what you normally get is that they tell you that Refer you to that other journal doesn't mean that they will accept it. So you just need to follow that place. That may be better for your journal. So this one uh, you are saying, whereby they refer you to journal and they tell you that it will not be uh, peer reviewed. I have not heard of it in my entire life. I think that uh, that must be a pediatric journal and ask you to pay $1,800. To me, that is one of the characteristics. That's one way to know. You know, I have a lady I work with. She's very, very good. I have a team of researchers, about 15 of them, are caught across Nigerian universities. This lady is in Federal University, Oyekiti. Uh, Oyekiti is fantastic. She's currently have her doing a workshop. So whenever I have a sort of suspicious thing like that, because I write to me reflect and I say, Loretta, what is this? And she says, Prof, ignore it. The one I received this morning, because she has a way, she has a software for checking for them. I got it this morning, I will be sent to her, and I'm sure by the time I check my mail, she will have sent. So please, that's, a, that's a one of the ways to know them. The second one you asked about, why do research and see ask for APC? Research is expensive. But actually, publishing itself is also expensive. I can tell you, uh, the journals have to maintain uh, the staff, they have to pay them, they have to pay for offices, and for example, for example, the journal I published, the, we have to we get indexed in so many indexing companies, and we pay somebody in Croatia to convert whatever article I've done into things that can go into PubMed, for example. PubMed does it; they used to do that for us, but now we have to pay them, and they pay in dollars. And secondly, one of the reasons those days is that you publish paper. For example, you s you spend money to to print copies of journals, because nobody will accept to edit. I can tell you that anybody who publishes online without having hard copies of that journal will not be indexed. And so you have to print, and printing has become copies. You print 200 copies, and it's not sold, because everything now is open access. It's no open access. So you have my, I have a place now where the journal is written the roof, because nobody is buying, because it's open access. So for that reason, for you to make account for that loss, in terms of you publishing and printing and still losing, then you have to pay APC. It also, and then again, it ranks according to the coverage. Are you covering, covering African countries? For example, if, it, if, it, if, it, if a journal is based in Africa, and you know that people here are generally not very buoyant, then you can reduce it. And in fact, some 
companies that some journals are published in the UK, US, they might actually give some charges to say students, to African publishers, discount and so on and so forth. Those contributions are always there. But it is for us to sustain journals. Now, journals have died in Nigeria. The death rate of journals published in Nigeria is 98%. What I mean is that a journal will start today, after five years, they die. A journal will start today, the man will become a professor, after that, shh, he dies. My journal, which I started in 1997, is publishing to date, not a single, single issue missed. <laughs> and we publish every month. The May edition is already in print, it's already come out. And the June, before I come back, I get back to my, I'm going to sign it, read it through it, make sure every page is right, and it goes to print, June edition. And by the end of June, if you think I'm lying, I'll give the website. June 30th, check it. You see Jabin Popovich. Journals like that don't function in Africa. And the only way we can function is to make sure that you pay some reasonable amount of money and you are transparent and honest and not corrupt in the way you manage the funds. Let me stop there. I won't talk more than that. Many institutional journals have died. There was a day somebody called me. We were in the Senate. I don't want to mention the university, but anybody can talk about it. And said, oh, the students in my journal have been mandatorily asked to buy that journal. Lecturers, if they don't buy, they will not pass their course. So, so, so. Then I was, at that time, I was, I was a dean. The guy was also a fellow dean. And he was my friend. So I said, the man said, you know, we have many composites that, that the students in that program, otherwise, if not so, the journal would have died. I say, and I've got up with Mr. Vassan Solo, that journal decided to die. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the whole Senate burst into laughter because he was my very good friend. We are two friends, everybody knew us friends. The man said, Why are you attacking your friend? I say, If you are not establishing a, a journal, and the only people who must buy it for you to survive are your students and your staff, then that journal doesn't exist to exist. I can tell you. Doesn't deserve to exist. Your journal is should be everybody must like it. They must have any reason to buy the journal. You don't have to push them. Give yourself credibility and so on and so forth. So APC should be a bit reasonable to comp depending on the circumstances in which you are publishing. And at the same time, I don't think we can, we can wish it away. I can tell you, if you want to publish in nature, you're ready to pay ten thousand dollars. You know nature. Professor Happy, are you hearing me? Nature. That's published in Nature, and it's ten thousand dollars. If you want to publish in Science, it's like top ranking journals. And if you publish ten papers in uh, Nature now, Covenant University will rank higher. And the reason you heard of Harvard, you heard of Oxford, Cambridge, is because they publish those journals. And all of you sitting here, please don't publish in any. Aim to publish in Nature. Aim to publish. Aim to become Nobel Prize laureates. When I was a medical student, Nigerian person. <laughs> Proceedings of Nigerian Academy. When I was a medical student, Professor Grillo used to say that we are just medical students. What should be aimed for in science is to become Nobel laureates. We got one before from this very state. Why don't we deserve another one? We deserve another one. And it can come from Rudiman University. And the only way we can do that is to publish high quality journal. And even if it means borrowing from the Vice Chancellor, and I know that the Vice Chancellor pays for article price. Thank you, sir. God bless you. It's the only university I've had that pays for APC. Let's clap for Redima University. <laughs> I know, why do I keep mentioning Redima? They will kill me. <laughs> because, because you are brothers. I did, <laughs> you are brothers. <laughs> Covenant University. Eh? I think you are the one in this country in doing that. <laughs> and then the other person you asked me is extraction, chromatography, no components. And the last question was, is it possible, what about journals, we accept negative results? Look, the heart of any publication, the heart is methodology. If you ask me, they say, I, I, I review for several journals, and there are two things I look at. The title, I go to the objectives, and I go to the mentors. If there's anything wrong with the method, I reject it. If somebody has done some work before and found positive results, the idea is that if you repeat that method accurately, in another setting, you should get similar result, isn't it? But however, if you do the work and get a new result, the first question is, did you do it correctly? Did you use that same method? 
Was you use the same chromatography? Did you use the same samples? I don't know what you could do in Nakumagota. Did you was it the same sensitivity? Was it the same this? Did you say reagents and so on and so forth? Methodology. And I I can review any paper in any discipline. Whether it's physics, chemistry, I can. Because the, the heart of a publication, of a scientific publication, is how you did it. It is what is called science is ability to replicate what you have done. For somebody else to replicate it somewhere else. And if they follow, that's why if you write, a, do a good paper, and you don't describe the methodology very well, they will not accept the paper. They will look at it and say, okay, fair enough, maybe describe it more. But if you describe it and it's wrong, so I can tell you, man, that if you describe that methodology and it's very correct, there are journals that will accept negative results. I want to do a study when I say AS, uh, AS. You know, there are people in Nigeria uh, that have, uh, st uh, uh, what do you call it? Eh? Sickle cell, AS. And before, there used to be a carriers that AS, people with women who are pregnant who have AS, tend to give birth to low birth weight babies. That's the normative. They said it. it go very quickly. So I did a lot of rigorous work. And I will say the title of the work when I finished is that women with AS are, do not, uh, are not likely to have, I don't remember the full title, they are not likely to have small babies in Nigerian women. But Nigerian women who are AS do not, I was confident enough that even though it will be published in Ghana, that women who have AS are likely to carry smaller babies. I was confident enough to say that in Nigerian women, AS does not dispose, dispose, predispose to small babies. And I said, take that methodology anywhere. Describe it. Go and repeat it. In Nigerian women, no. It was published. <laughs> 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 and it was published in International Journal of, of Studies and Gynecology. In those are my beginning of my career. So, ladies and gentlemen, negative results, provided methodology used is correct. And this can be, if the reviewers are going to be international, are going to do the negative results, if it is negative, that's contrary to the results of Professor Adebayo at the Covenant University. It, interestingly, my results show otherwise that what he said. And it is my rigorous method of research indicates and enables me to conclude based on the fact that I've done this accurately using all new methods and all that. As now for another way, chromatography. I think that's something you are showing me, LCMS, which I, which I think is a more modern way to look at small particles, like uh, uh, alpha phytoproteins and eh? of the So if you had it and you did uh, what you call it, high chromatography, is it APA? You did high performance. If no, there was something you call AP, HPSC. HPSC, and now you did it and got that results. And you now did it and use a. Uh, the higher method and did it and find that it's not correct. You can also report that to say that the reason that this result may be coming out to be otherwise is because you are using a more modern method, more accurate method of measuring this particular uh, uh, substance that you are talking about. So in that way, you can still publish it. Negative results is actually what certifies science and meaning that you are contrary and its argument is about discussion, about contrary views based on the evidence and so on and so forth. So conclusions must be given evidence. Once it's given evidence and you can provide the evidence, then you are, you are clean to go. You are going to go. Thank you very much. Please, would you put your hands together again for Prof. Thank you so much, sir, for doing justice to those questions. Answered like an expert. Thank you so much, sir. So right now, I'd like to bring up the Vice Chancellor of Covenant University to please bring us his closing remarks. The Vice Chancellor, sir, please would you put your hands together for the Vice Chancellor? Thank you so much, Mr. Moderator. At the speaker of today, the lecturer of today, you have done a very good job to this subject of this course. How many of you believe that? That Professor Friday Okonovoa has done an excellent job. And I'm sure the online participants are also clapping right there, right now. And the president of the Nigerian Academy of Sciences is equally doing that. One more time, let's give him a wonderful round of applause. 
Thank you so much for the insight. Thank you so much for showing us how the right way to go that in order for us to be able to stand at par with the international community with respect to best practices and avoiding predatory journals. Let me also mention here, Prof, I have come across journal of negative report. There is a journal title called uh, journal called journal of negative reports, and so well, all negative reports just send it to such journals, <laughs> and I'm sure it's going to be published if it is not predatory journal, so it will be acceptable. And I like to mention here that, um, like I mentioned in my earlier remark, that Covenant has an excellent and very robust um, policies that guides our processes here. We support publication of articles and we equally give article processing charges. If we have paid 2,000 euros, 2,000 pounds, 5,000 pounds, depending on the location and the impact factor like you mentioned, the percentile, we also subscribe very well with the Scopus and we, uh, we do that very well here and we pay for that. And that's exactly what we do here at Covenant. The moment we measure the impact factor and at the same time, we see that it is also the percentile, the Scopus percentile is also high and it is also not a predatory journal. You can be rest assured that it will be supported by the university. And the university goes excellently to promote such. Even among our postgraduate students here, we pay for Q1 journals and Q2 journals. Recently, we've been promoting that in the university in the last one or two years. And both even Q3 and Q4 journals are equally supported by the university. But the most important thing is that it will, it must be listed in Scopus, and it must also be an excellent journal, not a predatory journal. And um, again, your lecture has given us an insight, and there are so many lessons that we're able to learn from your lecture today. And I also want to thank Dr. Odubanjo for giving us the processes and the procedures on how to becoming a fellow of the academy. Well, I can let you know that Covenant University faculty will soon become a member of a fellow of the Academy of Science very in no distant time. In no distant time will be there. Now that we know what it takes, then we get on. I'm sure I have the faculty here, we have the distinguished professors here and who are ready to, and matching to become a member of that and um, who will be nominated anyway. You, can do, you, you don't join. You've been told it's not a party that you join. Well, the language is well communicated. Thank you so much, every one of you, for coming again. And thank you so much, Prof, for giving us that wonderful lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, you agree with me that um, it's as if this kind of lecture should go. Because, Prof, we can't even, we didn't believe you that you told us that you were only hospitalized. You only came out of hospital 48 hours ago. Wow, but your passion, your zeal shows that this thing is inside the blood. Even on your sick bed, we know you can even deliver a lecture of this nature. Once again, thank you so much. And our relationship with the Nigeria Academy of Science has just begun. And uh, we pray that we can keep things on the greater. Country. Once again, thank you all for coming and God bless you. Let's put hands together for Professor Kolawole Ajanoku. Thank you, sir. Standing on existing protocol, we have just a few announcements for this occasion. Uh, our lecturer for today, Professor Konofua Friday, I have to put the FAS there, sir. In first class. <laughs> and also, uh, our executive secretary, we will, with your team, we will welcome you in one of our guest house restaurant.
just for a brief uh, chat. Yes, just for a brief chat. <laughs> PG students, you have to stay behind and then see the subdean of the of the co of the college of the school. And uh, I think after this program, it will be good enough for us at the foyer there to have a picture of this occasion, just to have that as part of our repository in the university. Thank you for coming. We appreciate you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Prof, I kind of like chats that take place in the guest house. <laughs> Those are very, very good chats. Please, yes, please join virtually. <laughs> from a safe distance. And then the chats can continue. Thank you very much, sir. I'd like to bring up right now to properly thank every person that has made this program a success. Please would you put your hands together as we welcome the re Acting Registrar of Covenant University, Mr. Emmanuel Igban. You're welcome, sir. Thank you, the Master of Event for today. The Vice Chancellor, permit me to stand on already established protocol. First, I want to appreciate God for making today's event a huge success. May his name be glorified in the name of Jesus. I equally want to appreciate the Chancellor and the Chairman Board of Regents of Covenant University, Dr. David Oyedekbo, and the entire members of the Board of Regents for creating this enabling environment at Covenant for creating knowledge and restoring the dignity of the black man. May God's name be glorified in Jesus' name. I want to appreciate my amiable Vice Chancellor, Professor Abiodu H. Adebayo, for his dynamic leadership and for superintending the success of organization of this lecture. Sir, you are blessed. May God bless you. I warmly want to appreciate our guest lecturer of today, Professor Friday Okonofia, a, yes, a fellow of Nigerian Academy of Science and a pioneer vice chancellor of Nigerian Medical School, University of Medical Sciences. So thank you for this lecture presented today, Thursday, despite the fact that your name is Friday. We appreciate you, sir. So we deeply appreciate you for, for this revealing and empowering lecture. May God bless you and refresh you, spirit, soul, and body in Jesus' name. We also want to appreciate the Executive Secretary of Nigerian Academy of Science, Dr. Odubanjo, for not only grazing this lecture, but also for telling us what it takes to become a fellow of Nigerian Academy of Science as well as the process and procedures that are involved. May God bless you, sir, and the entire academy, most especially for pioneering excellence in science. Also want to appreciate in the entire management of Covenant University, our eminent professors that are here, our faculty and staff of the university for grazing this lecture. May God bless you all in Jesus' name. Finally, I want to appreciate our PG students. I know that today you are richly blessed and you will never be a, a victim of publishing in a pediatric journals. Thank you for being part of today's event and you are highly blessed in Jesus' name. Finally, I thank you all. May God bless you. Thank you, please. Would you put your hands together for the Acting Registrar of Covenant University, and we thank you, sir, for thanking us. Right now, we want to bring this program to an end. Of course, we started with prayer, and we would want to start uh, conclude with prayer. I'd like to bring up the Dean of CMSS, my own personal Dean. Please put your hands together for Professor Abiola Babajidi. 
Praise the Lord. Please let's rise up for faith, closing prayer. In Jesus' name. Our Father and our God, we give you thanks and praise. We appreciate you for setting today apart for us in Covenant University. We thank you for your, our guests here today. We thank you for the lecture. We thank you for how everything has done since the beginning of the day. With a heart that is filled with gratitude, we say thank you in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for the insightful lecture that we have had today. With it, we have grown in wisdom, and we pray that your hand will continually be upon us in our academic activities, even as we use this in our programs in Jesus' name. We pray for your son that you have used here today to bless us. We ask that you increase him in wisdom in Jesus' name. We commit the academy to your hand, the academic. We ask Almighty God that the academy will continue to grow higher in height in Jesus' name. We thank you for Covenant University and for everyone that is here today. We appreciate your hand in Jesus' name. Lord, as they go back, Lord, we ask that your presence go with them in Jesus' name. Father, everyone that is departing from here, there shall be no bad news concerning everyone in Jesus' name. We appreciate you, our Father. Accept our thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Surely, the Lord's goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our life. And we shall dwell in the presence of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Peace. Praise God. Thank you very much. Please, while we remain standing, the guest speaker will please exit the building. Please, let's remain standing while we exit. And please, if you will just put your hands together again for our speaker today, Professor Friday Okonofua, FAS. Thank you very much. And also, Dr. M. Oladoi Odubanjo, thank you very much. Members of management of Covenant University, thank you so much for being part of this program.